Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company. This holiday season, we're bringing you some of our favorite interviews from the year. Here's what's coming up. Tonight, in a year where cultural connections have helped preserve our mental health, we turn to some of the great artists we've hosted. The Monty Python legend turned explorer Michael Palin guides us through a life of adventure. Wonderkin photographer Tyler Mitchell goes radical, exploring black people at leisure. And then, as domestic abuse surges in lockdown, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet Natasha Trethewey shares her own experience with our Michelle Martin. And from homelessness to country music stardom, Margot Price tells her story and plays us out from her latest album. Almond Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to this special edition of the program, everyone. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. This year, those in the arts, culture, and hospitality are really struggling as lockdowns devastate their sector. But it's also been a year where people have relied on art, television, film, music, and reading to endure social isolation. So tonight, we're looking back at some of our favorite interviews with artists. And why not kick things off with a bit of a laugh? Michael Palin is one of the world's most beloved comedians. As part of Monty Python's Flying Circus, he He's been a cult hero for generations of fans. And not one to be put in a box, he's also become a trusted explorer, traveling the world and reporting back on TV and writing books. Now, at 77, Michael Palin tells me that despite the obvious limitations, his sense of adventure is nowhere near over. Michael Palin, welcome to the program. Thank you. I just want to ask, because you know, you're such a now known for your travel, how has COVID been for you? What has lockdown meant for you? Well, it's, meant, it's, sh it's shut down my traveling yeah. time, but in a good way, because I've actually had time to look back on all the traveling I've done. The last 30 years, I've been all over the place. And you know, you probably know yourself, it becomes a bit of a blur if you're not careful. And it's really been quite nice to be at home. I've, I have not left. I've not spent a night away from my house for a year, so that's it, which is just un unheard of. When you look back now in lockdown, what ones, if you can, you know, really, really sort of leap out at you? Which ones that you're looking back at do you say, wow? Well, they're all, they're, they were all remarkable. I mean, they really were. There wasn't one easy one, there were, and there wasn't one dull one. They were all fairly extraordinary. Um, some days I feel I'd like to be up in the mountains in the Himalaya or the Andes, which are just sensational. Other times I rather, you know, I remember going to the Philippines and learning how to scuba dive in about two days flat. Let's just go back to the being a little bit. Where did you first get the urge to perform, to make people laugh? When did you first kind of know in your bones that this mm. might be something you're good at? I think it happens very early on. I mean. I always knew I was curious and, and wanted to go to places where other people said, oh, well, no, no, let's not go that far. <laughs> but I wanted to go there. So that was, I think, the traveling thing. I think it was also a feeling that I, I saw that I kind of saw the world very often a little step back from my friends. I enjoyed being teams and sport and all that, but I, was, I enjoyed looking at the world from the outside. And I think that was part of the performing thing. I was able to you know, mimic the masters at, at school, which is sort of where a lot of things happen. So I made people laugh quite easy. I could just do a voice and they thought this was wonderful. I've always felt myself comfortable with being the observer, looking at the madness of the world um, that we're all in. I mean, I've read that your, your dad was a, you know, a bit sort of a yes. bit harsh, had a, had a stammer, yeah. wasn't particularly encouraging. Uh, well, you know, my father, he did, I mean, his stammer was, I think, um, the real problem throughout his life. And, and he never, 
um, he was never able to deal with it, and so that made him very, you know, tetchy, and he would get, you know, quite quite sharp sometimes. But he had a sense of humour, and obviously he loved, you know, having his son around. But my mum was really the great uh, influence, if you like. She was just sort of feet on the ground, nothing phased her at all, despite all the, you know, things she'd been through. And she liked the idea that her young son was going to be an actor or a performer or yeah. a writer. Yes, yeah, she was happy with it. My father wasn't at all. My father was deeply concerned that I might end up in the acting profession. So he was not keen for me to act. My mother, on the other hand, was very happy. I used to, when he was out of an evening, when I was quite young, I would, I would read her sort of chunks of Shakespeare, of me playing all the parts. Can you imagine that? She had to be a wonderful mum to listen to all this going on. And she but was your audience, you'd do it for she her? She was the audience, yes, well, I think so. She may have nodded off a bit, but what I can remember later was when we did uh, Monty Python's Life of Brian. My mother was a, a keen churchgoer, um, but she, she defended absolutely um, our right to do the Life of Brian. Because I, I told her it's not about Jesus, Jesus is not Brian, it's about the church, it's about some people just accepting what, doing what they're told. And she would take people on in the little place where she was living once she retired. She wouldn't, you know, despite her religious background, she'd be saying, no, there's nothing wrong with this, it's all about the intolerance of the church. And people would go, oh yes, Mrs. Palin. Oh. Gosh, that's pretty amazing. Actually, yeah. you just led me right into a clip because somewhat around Life of Brian afterwards, perhaps, you and John Cleese had a television debate with an actual bishop and with Malcolm Muggeridge, who was yes. a, a commentator, a very famous British commentator. They both were at your throat. Would you imagine that your scene, for instance, of the Sermon on the Mount, the scene in, this, in your, your film of the Sermon on the Mount, right. is not ridiculing one of the most sublime utterances that any human being has ever spoken on this earth, of course it is. No, no, it's Absolutely making fun not. of the f guy who's remembered it wrong and of the people who don't understand it and miss mm. the point. Well, I think, I that think that's really unfair because I think that a lot of people looking in will think that we have, we have actually ridiculed Christ yes. physically. Christ is played by an actor, Ken Colley. He speaks the words. Um, from the Sermon on the Mount. He's treated absolutely respectfully. The camera then pans away. We go to right to the back of the crowd to someone who shouts, speak up, mm. because they cannot hear him. <laughs> now, I mean, if that utterly, no, no, that that utterly no, undermines that faith is, in Christ, no, no, then I think your faith can be turned into strong. Say, I started off by saying that this is such a 10th rate film that I don't believe that it would disturb anybody's yes, I know you started with an faith. open mind. I realise that. I, 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 I said, <laughs> so, you seem to have been actually quite angry and irritated with them by the time this debate sort of got fully underway. I was very angry and very, very disappointed because John and I had gone into the debate knowing that we were going to be given quite a, um, a roughing up um, in a religious sense by a bishop and, and by Malcolm Muggeridge. So we'd, you know, we, we'd looked and, and worked out what our answers were going to be and what we felt about making the film and we were going to defend it. And there, in the end, they didn't actually even atta attack us for the content of the film. They just sort of threw abuse around. And when the bishop ended up with saying, well, I hope you make your 30 pieces of silver, I think that was a nadir. And I felt, I actually did feel very embarrassed for, for the church, for authority, for the authorities in the church, uh, and for that particular generation, I thought, they must do better than that. Come I must on. say, that was very vicious, because for those who don't know, that's a reference to the 30 pieces of silver yes. that Judas received yeah. for betraying Jesus Christ. Mm. The whole world bought into Life of Brian. Everybody still quotes it. It's just still <laughs> such an amazing cultural touchstone. So talking about the crucifixion, you play a very proper and polite Roman yes. as a group of condemned are coming in and, and you're telling them where to go. Here's the clip. Next. Crucifixion. Yes. Good. Out of the door, line on the left, one cross each. Next. Crucifixion. Yes. Good. Out of the door, line on the left, one cross each. Next. Crucifixion. Uh, no, freedom. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, freedom for me. They said I hadn't done anything so I could go free and live on an island somewhere. Oh. oh, well, that's jolly good. Well, off you go then. Now, nah, man, you're putting your leg. It's crucifixion, really. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. Well, out of the door. Yeah, out of the way. Out the door. One cross each. Line on the left. Line on the left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Crucifixion. 
Yes, good. Uh, so what is that if it's not mockery? Well, I think that's, if you look at it closely, it's actually saying a little something about the time and the historical period. And that was, well, that was actually the background to a lot of the life of Brian. The fact that he, you know, Brian had so many followers was because we'd read that there was a, a, a messiah fever at that time. There was this sort of feeling that the world was coming to an end, the messiah was around somewhere. I was just putting in that character, putting in place someone who had probably come from a very nice family outside Rome and rather comfortable and had been sent off to do his army service in Judea in this god-awful place with all these rather strange people and there he was trying to be as understanding as possible you know and when Eric says oh you know uh, no I can't I'll, 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 so I'll go to Ireland and, and, and live, live on this island oh that's wonderful no he's just joking it's crucifixion really which is my favorite line in the film and power personified by the Romans, being taken for a ride, people laughing at power, which is actually happens quite a bit in, in um, Life of Brian, including, you know, um, Pontius Pilate, when they all roar with laughter at him because he can't, can't say Rome, you know. So listen, you're talking about Eric Idle there, and I, I'm really interested by what you say about power and skewering power. Now should be I mean, just a land of riches for people who want to do the kind of thing that you used to do. Mockery, humor, satire. Yes. And clearly the President of the United States is a target-rich environment. How do you feel, um, or do you feel that there has been an adequate skewering in the way you guys did of the mm. current autocratic tendencies? Well, I, I, I mean, I feel, well, take Donald Trump for a start, very, very difficult to be funnier and more absurd and more outrageous than he really is. And there really is not much else you can say. Um, you know, people see him as a, as a, well, not a figure of fun, actually, a rather more dangerous figure than that. But you know what I mean? People already see that. There's nothing much a comedian can add to it, saying, oh, by the way, did you know that Donald Trump's got an orange face? We all know that. He has his... You know, hair done at $75,000 a time. All those little things that one might have dreamt up exist. They're there already, you know. He's outdone the satirists. And I feel that's happening, you know, it, it's a bit like that here as well. I mean, with, with Boris and his mad hair, looks like somebody that's been created um, by a satirical show, but he's actually the Prime Minister. So what do we do? I don't know. Just um, stay quiet. No, you don't stay quiet. We want you to try and find the humour there somewhere. Um, but it's difficult to find at the moment, to be honest. Back in your day, you used to have the Ministry of Silly Walks and, and all sorts yes. of things like that. And you, you must have thought about what it means to try to get under the skin of modern day politicians. Mm. What do you think is the best way to get under the skin of, of those who we're discussing now? It's very difficult to know. I think you have to somehow, well, you can quote them back at each other for a start because what they're saying is sometimes so completely outrageous. But otherwise I think you've just got to, you know, um, and you've got to find a, a, a way, you've got to find another way of looking at what's going on. Um, not just saying these are ridiculous people. You've got to say there's something quite dangerous that's happening here. I mean, I, I would, you, you know, if I was doing something about Trump or something like that, I would look at the rallies, for instance, because I think those are quite sinister. I would just have a, a group of people who shout at each other all the time. They always shout all the time. Yeah, I shout at you, don't shout at me, because that's the way you are. I shout at you. They're, you know, Convention of the Shouters, which is what it's all about, just people screeching at each other. So maybe one could do something like that. I just wondered, when you, because I believe Monty Python first aired on PBS in the United States. Yes, Where this absolutely. interview is also being aired. Yes, um, thank God for PBS. What did you think? I mean, A, how did they get it and not the other broadcast networks? Mm. How did that happen? And how did Americans are not known for their sense of irony or... <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, that's very ironic, the whole situation. Most of the big American companies are passed on it. I mean, ABC, people like that really didn't want the shows as they were played in England. They would take bits of them and all that. Um, a man from Dallas, PBS station, was in New York 
um, looking at BBC product. There was a terrific storm. He was late leaving for the airport. He said, what else have you got? What's this circus thing? So they showed him the flying circus. He took it back to Dallas because he thought it was quite funny. Uh, just one show and showed it to his, the PBS team at Dallas. And they loved it. Um, they said, this is really odd and strange. Have you got any more? So they rang the BBC in, in New York and got them. Oh, well, we'll look in the cupboard. We'll have to go downstairs. Yes, we've got, we have got some more. How many? Well, we've got 44 more. Right. And he just bought the lot. And they ran them over one weekend, uh, a sort of Python telethon in Dallas. They just be completely, um, you know, went, went, went ballistic on it. And the, this was picked up by other PBS stations. Um, and that's how it caught on. And it was students and it was, uh, you know, the, the younger audience that absolutely loved it. They didn't understand it particularly, but it was so different to anything else that yeah. was on American television. And there were no ads or anything like that. And it was sending up authority, it was sending up everything. And they just said, uh, well, whatever it is, we love this because there's nothing else like it. Recently you were knighted. Yes. You're Sir Michael Palin. I giggled a bit when I read the reaction <laughs> of one of your colleagues. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, the taller member? Yeah. Probably, yes, that's right, yes. The one who said, oh, great to see you've been knitted? Uh, oh, no, that was Terry Gilliam. Oh, yes, there you go. Terry Gilliam said, great to see you've been knitted. Yes. Just I, in time for the cold weather. That's right, that's, that was Terry Gilliam. God it's good. Him. Yeah. And then the taller fellow, the John Cleese fellow, hmm. he said the following about you. It shows that really hard work can overcome complete mediocrity. <laughs> and I think it's a tribute, it's an encouragement to all not particularly talented and rather mediocre people mm. to see what can be achieved by mm -hmm. sheer hard work and good luck. Yes, no, well, he embodies that so well. <laughs> <laughs> Are you all great friends? We're pretty good friends, uh, basically. You know, the usual sort of, sort of last, like problems management, you know, what we decide to do as a group and all that. But basically, we're very good friends. We still make each other laugh, which is the main thing. And we just greatly miss Graham and Terry. Mm. We really do. I mean, you know, they were such Python as a sort of, it was the six of us as writers and, and, and performers. And as a little group, we held each other together. You know, whoever else was, was, was employing us, we knew what we wanted to do. And it, it taught me a lot about being, uh, about artistic independence and creative independence. We were able to sort of get through things that people would say, you can't do that. We said, well, let's have a go. And we did it and it worked most times. Possibly because so, nobody knew what you were talking about, those in authority. Well, y yes. They no, didn't I, know I, they were being made fun of, maybe. No, no, I think, no, that's true about satire. People always think it's the other person. Oh, it's not me, it's him, isn't it? You're 77. Is there yeah. anything on the Michael Palin bucket list? When you look, you know, down the road, what do you still want to do? I want to, I, I want to keep learning and I want to keep responsive to the world, you know, I just, there's so much going on, there's so many amazing things happening. I know at the moment we're in deep trouble with coronavirus and all that, but I know we'll get through that. And as a result of coronavirus, I think we'll see some very ingenious and inventive work coming out. And I'm, you know, interested to see what it is. It's not going to be normal. We're not going through normal times. So I, I want to sort of just, just be able to um, take it all in. That's really it. And, and, I've always been slightly instinctive. I've never had a, a, a big game plan and things have come up out of the blue and I'm, I hope they will continue to do so. Um, well, it's very nice to see through your eyes the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, thank you, <laughs> yes. Thank well, you very much for being with us. Thanks. A hopeful note as we enter a new year filled with new possibilities. Now from a man who spent his life in front of the camera to one who's building his career behind it. Tyler Mitchell became the first black photographer in 126 years to shoot the cover of American Vogue, and he was just 23 years old. His cover girl, none other than Beyonce. And now, at the grand old age of 25, Tyler Mitchell has released his new book. It's called I Can Make You Feel Good. And I sat down with him to talk about where he points his camera and why that act is so important. Tyler Mitchell, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm fascinated by what you say that photographing black people at leisure 
is radical. Not the fact that they're at le leisure, but photographing them is, yeah. is radical. Yeah. Why is that? Well, it, it, it's, you know, it has to do with denied histories, right? Um, and this idea that visualizing and making images and projecting those and stating that visualizing black folks enjoying their lives is important, right? What's central to that in my work is that existing in public space for black folks in America has been denied psychically in our minds at any moment that you know freedom or that enjoyment that we're having or that pleasure could be taken away or stripped away so to me this book you know stands for a, a beacon of that this is called um, I can make you feel good yeah what does that mean simply who are you saying it to it's the title of a Shalimar song really I heard it from a soul song yeah. and uh, I heard it in the Atlanta airport when I was traveling to Amsterdam for my show and I thought that's the title I love this idea of it being a really um, simple, unacademic statement about feeling good, about optimism, but it also has a gut punch. It's very direct. It's from me to you, from the photographer to the viewer. So, and, and in your opening statement here, you mm -hmm. have some pretty, you know, pointed and poignant messages. So I'm going to read a little bit from, from the statement. I often think about what white fun looks like mm. and this notion that black people can't have the same. My work comes from a place of wanting to push back against this lack. I feel an urgency to create a body of images where black people are visualized as free, expressive, effortless and sensitive. Mm. I feel like you're trying to correct a balance. Mm. Maybe. An imbalance. Maybe. I'm mainly trying to create like a self-contained utopia, a self-contained world. And yeah, it was about bringing my own autobiographical experience to my instinctive response to those images. So, you know, some of them, well, they're all just kind of normal stuff yeah. that you would see. The famous Dejeuner sur l'air yeah. iconography of mm. white people in a painting at leisure. Yeah. And you have the red gingham mat or tablecloth where, yeah. where, where you've got some people lying down. You've got people at fun in, in a park. What are they saying to you, those particular pictures? I think about people like Kerry James Marshall, who's been making amazing work for years about the black experience. I think about what he said when he was trying to bring together with his vignette paintings, Rococo paintings, right? Flowery or kind mm -hmm. of over the top, um, just luxurious enjoyments of life, right? Scenes, Rococo paintings were essentially frivolous. They were all about frivolity. And I love that he was trying to bring together that with some of the social kind of or political feelings and statements that he wanted to kind of unify in one painting. So I think this, these pictures kind of respond to that. So, I mean, look, Sozo with the orange hula hoop. I mean, it's such a beautiful picture. Thank you. Had you seen that elsewhere? I don't think I've seen that before. Right. I mean, each picture that I made or that I put in that book, I thought, this is something I haven't quite seen before. Right. And maybe if I had, it hadn't been brought to the fore enough yet and it hadn't been brought to to a bigger conversation that needed to be had. So. And I think this one is called Still from Idyllic Space. It's um, two boys with, with gummy bears behind them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, a lot of it's going cool. back to Georgia. Yeah, it's just cool and it's instinctively cool, but it's also thinking about growing up in Georgia and what my summers looked like in the South. And also you think about that red gingham fabric and that picnic. That for me is what the South looks like. That fabric to me says Georgia. So. White South. Any South. Really? Yeah. So those were images that you actually grew up with? Yeah. So what was it like growing up in Marietta, a, a suburb of Atlanta? Well, I grew up middle class. The suburban existence is, you know, it's about having space. There's a big front yard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's leisure and there's a lot of the things in the pictures that I had growing up. Um, and those kind of experiences and kind of freedom, I started to understand as I grew up more, was luxury. Right, having a summer to kind of think about what I wanted to do with my life. Those things are freedoms that, you know, I'm kind of posturing or gesturing or suggesting all black folks should have. So for me, that's important. And I think that upbringing was really actually really positive. So this is a dramatic and really powerful cover image. Thank you. So you've got a line of black young men. Mm. I don't know how old they are, but they look yeah. young. I made it here, actually. Did you? Oh, yeah. Yes, I thought in, so, because it's called the boys Marshall's. of Walthamstow. Mm -hmm. I looked at it, my first impression, like my first reaction, mm. was that the chain, mm -hmm. was the heads bowed, mm -hmm. was a little bit of subjugation. Mm. Yeah. Is that what you intended? I think it's a mixture of everything. You know, I think it's like that landscape, those willow trees in Waltham so spoke to me. They reminded me of Georgia. They reminded me of the South. They reminded me of some element of the global black experience. 
Um, and there's beauty in that, right? There's these boys enjoying moments before this picture was taken, all these boys were playing tag together. And there's this amazing video I made of them kind of enjoying one another. And that kind of black male kind of unity is important to visualize. But yeah, you're right. Um, there is a somber note and the chain is definitely like the punctum of the picture. I think there's like subtle reference made to images of, you know, chain gangs in Louisiana, right? right? In Georgia and those histories. How interesting is it to be Tyler Mitchell today? <laughs> I'm asking you because you're 25 years old, you're young. At 23, you did something that no other black photographer had done. I mean, perish the thought that there'd never been a black photographer at Vogue, certainly not to have shot the cover or the September issue. Yeah. Just process that for me. Yeah, still processing. <laughs> I, think, um, I think in some way, I was always interested in many, many things, just as a person, as an artist. Um, there were assignments and commissions and pictures that I was making that spoke to people on many different levels. I was photographing musicians. I was photographing, I had the opportunity to photograph Emma Gonzalez um, and a lot of the survivors of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Parkland shooting um, and a lot of young gun reform activists. So I was interested in that. Um, I was interested in making images of kind of black male compassion, right? And kind of envisioning a new sort of black masculinity. How did it come about that Beyonce, well, you were thrown in at this, you know, your first big major shoot like that yeah. to somebody as global and as mega as Beyonce? How did it feel? It felt amazing. I mean, you, you know, that's a great moment. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really, and it's an honor to photograph someone like that and to work with a magazine like Vogue, mm -hmm. so, yeah. And you made her regal and very flowery. Yeah, I was referencing, you know, it was referencing Rococo paintings, mm -hmm. like I said, you know, it was thinking about the luxury of frivolity, mm -hmm. thinking about the luxury of having time, mm -hmm. the luxury of having space to breathe and those flowers and that amazing image. So, you know, it was a great collaboration. And it wasn't obvious that you were going to do fashion, right? I mean, you started, I think, doing selfies and skateboarding videos and yeah things i was like making that. films of my friends like yeah. skateboarding in georgia so um yeah i kind of avalanched into photography by actually making a trip to havana cuba um i made i went in 2015 on an exchange through my school at nyu um didn't know anything other than americans weren't allowed to go to cuba so i wanted to go and um a teacher of mine looked at pictures that i'd already made and identified them as fashion photographs. And I said, why and how? And he said, well, it looks like you dressed these people up and you took pictures of them, didn't you? I said, yeah, with the sweater out of my closet. Like I thought they looked cool in something I had in my house. And um, he was like, well, that's a fashion photograph then. You've dressed them in something. You've spoken about an element of style in the picture. And to me that switched on a light of like a fashion photograph can be much, much more about the person than necessarily the brand or yeah. the clothes or any of those things. Certainly the language around photography is all about hierarchy. The mm -hmm. subject, mm -hmm. capture, yeah. shoot, God forbid. I'm constantly thinking about that yeah. and constantly trying to in every way, you know, subvert the old notions of what those relationships were. So, you know, you think about older fashion photographers where it was very dictatorial almost. You know, they would really tell the model to the T where they wanted their finger, how they wanted their body, how they wanted them to lean, how they wanted them to look. And I think these pictures indicate a more collaborative process. Mm -hmm. They speak to a relationship, a true relationship between myself and the subjects, a lot of whom are friends or friends of friends or just people in a larger contemporary community. So for me, it's about thinking with photography having its 200 year history of hierarchical relationships, how do I subvert those as best as I can? Yeah. You've got another picture. I mean, it's called Gun 2016. <laughs> yeah. What were you thinking? What was going on? I was thinking about Tamir Rice, to be honest with you. Um, he's the 12 year old boy who was killed, you know, in a park near his house in Cleveland um, because police believed him to be armed and he was playing with a toy pellet gun. You know, Tamir and so many other stories that we hear of, you know, these are about kind of projected and imagined realities rather than real ones. So um, as much as a picture is a fantasy, you know, that image of a gun speaks to those histories. So, yeah. You said black beauty is an act of justice. Mm. Explain. It is. <laughs> it is. Um, that, that comes from a lot of different places. The, the depiction and imagination that we have as black folks is a strong and powerful thing, I think, for ourselves, for our community, 
it's kind of an important self-assurement to envision ourselves, to dress ourselves to the nines, um, you know, and, and to picture that. You know, people have understood that since the beginning of time. You know, I think about Frederick Douglass, who was the most photographed man of the 19th century. He traveled up and down the East Coast and he would collaborate with photo studios up and down the East Coast as he was writing his autobiography. And he understood the importance of his image. He would style himself. He would groom himself, he would dress himself, and he would sit for the photo studios in the late 1800s. And he knew that handing that image out to people alongside his story as a free slave, um, or as a freed slave, um, was important, right? And so presenting images of ourselves as beautiful is an act of justice, we know this. Clearly, like everybody in the world, you were shocked and devastated by what happened to George Floyd. Mm you are also at the center of the conversation about, mm. you know, black power, black visibility, black talent, black, you know, just being there and, and, and people wondering why this didn't happen earlier. Mm. So does that part of it weigh on you? Do you feel any sort of responsibility or? Um, I think the most important thing that my work is kind of suggesting or posturing is um, that freedom and whatever that means to the individual is the most important thing. So for me in this book and in this work, it's about hula hooping, you know? It's about skateboarding, it's about jump roping, it's about enjoying space and taking up space, and it's about, you know, existing. So the work is both of this moment and not of this moment. And I think that work is my life's work. So I think for me, you know, I try and make sure that freedom and expansiveness is, is, is what I push for. So You obviously uh, have an optimistic vision of life. Mm. Are you optimistic about the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd? What, does something about it make you hopeful? I think I have to be, you know. With a book called I Can Make You Feel Good and with, with everything that I'm doing, I think I have to be. I think there are amazing beacons um, of progress. I think there, and I think we have to focus on those and then we have to question and we have to interrogate and we have to look into everything and then we have to basically come up with solutions. And I think that's the only way, you know, things can go forward, you know. Um, I think about Moonlight, you know, a movie that was basically not designed to do much of anything in the theater, is not designed to do much of anything commercially. Barry Jenkins will say that. And I think about the trail it had to winning Best Picture and the conversations and the lights that I saw in people's eyes as I was experiencing that movie and as the world was experiencing that movie. And I was like, oh yeah, this is possible, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kamala Harris, cover of Vogue, shot by Tyler Mitchell? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna break a story? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Never know. <laughs> Tyler Mitchell, thank you so much. Thank indeed. you for having me. Well, now that she's vice president-elect, we could well see a Kamala Harris cover shot by Tyler Mitchell. We turn now, though, to a confronting topic. As countries around the world have faced lockdowns, domestic violence has spiked dramatically, leading the World Health Organization to describe it as a shadow pandemic. Our next guest has experienced the devastating impact of violence in the home. Pulitzer Prize winning poet Natasha Trethewey was 19 when her stepfather murdered her mother. This excruciating pain is the subject of her new book, Memorial Drive, a daughter's memoir. She also writes about growing up in the 60s in the Deep South as a child of mixed race. Here she is in a raw and often emotional conversation with our Michelle Martin. Thanks, Christian. Natasha Trathaway, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I think many people are familiar with your work. You've won multiple awards. You're a respected, highly sought after college professor, teacher, former poet laureate of the United States, a high honor. I feel comfortable in saying that I'm sure millions of people know your work. And I remember reading a brief biography of you. It said her father, Eric Trethaway, was a poet. Her mother died when she was in college. Mm -hmm. Her mother died when she was in college. So just to get to the, the core terrible details, your stepfather, your mother's ex-husband, who had physically abused her, and frankly, if I may say, emotionally abused you, mm -hmm. uh, killed her when you were only 19 years old and when she was 40, she had finally gotten free of him. And frankly, it's, he seems to have been threatening her for, for years, uh, for what I can see. Why this book now? Did, 
did this book sort of force its way out of you? Why this book and why now? I, you know, I think it did. You know, I, I've been carrying this grief with me now for 35 years. And more and more, my mother was being erased. Um, this erasure was ongoing. Um, it was particularly easy for people, as I said, to draw this line uh, straight through my father to me because my father was a poet. My father was also my white parent. So there was something both racial, racialized and patriarchal in this assumption that I'm who I am because of my father. And it wounded me deeply that um, people didn't understand that the thing that hurt me into poetry, that uh, the thing that I had tried to contend with my whole adult life was the loss of my mother. I felt like I needed to tell that story and to place who she was and what she meant to me in its proper perspective. Uh, the, the title of your book, of course, is Memorial Drive, and it comes at this remarkable moment of reckoning for the country, where this country is reckoning with its racial past, as it does periodically. And one of the remarkable things about your book is the way it intertwines your personal history with that of the history of the South and of the country. So I was, to that end, I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind reading a passage for us. From oh, book. of course, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. This is from the first chapter, which is called Another Country. In the spring of 1966, when I was born, my mother was a couple of months shy of her 22nd birthday. My father was out of town traveling for work, so she made the short trip from my grandmother's house to Gulfport Memorial Hospital as planned without him. On her way to the segregated ward, she could not help but take in the tenor of the day. Witnessing the barrage of rebel flags lining the streets, private citizens, lawmakers, Klansmen, often one and the same, raising them in Gulfport and small towns all across Mississippi. She could not have missed the paradox of my birth on that particular day, a child of miscegenation, an interracial marriage still illegal in Mississippi and as many as 20 other states. Sequestered on the colored floor, my mother knew the country was changing, but slowly. She had come of age in the summer of 1965, turning 21 in the wake of Bloody Sunday, the Watts riots, and years of racially motivated murders in Mississippi. Unlike my father, who'd grown up a white boy in rural Nova Scotia, hunting and fishing, free to roam the open woods, my mother had come into being a black girl in the deep south, hemmed in, bound to a world circumscribed by Jim Crow. Though my father believed in the idea of living dangerously, the necessity of taking risks, my mother had witnessed the necessity of dissembling, the art of making of one's face an inscrutable mask before whites who expected of blacks a servile deference. It's always tricky asking an artist how she makes her art, <laughs> but <laughs> But I am wondering how you arrived at this voice, how you arrived at this kind of intertwining of the personal with the, the social story, mm -hmm. you know, the mixing of the races, the expectation of white supremacy, the expectation of deference. Was it hard? Well, you know, it, it took a long time to write this book. It, it took me seven years to write the book. And I think part of the hardest thing was to figure out the voice. Uh, who am I in telling this story? And what is the story that needs to be told? I mean, because they're obviously the, the tragic facts of my mother's life and mine, but that's not the story. And I, when I really, what I realized, and it has everything to do with that intersection of uh, public history, the history of uh, the Civil War and the aftermath and the monuments we've erected to remember or misremember the Civil War, and my mother's death at the base of Stone Mountain, that largest monument to the Confederacy. Those things converge, and they actually represent my two existential wounds. You know, in his memorial to William Butler Yeats, W.H. Arden wrote, Mad Ireland Hurt You Into Poetry. Mm -hmm. Well, likewise, my nation, my native land, my South, my Mississippi, with its history, of violence and racial oppression inflicted my first wound. 
um, being born there on Confederate Memorial Day was as if I were given that history to write. And then when my mother's death occurred at the base of that mountain, I could see how what is remembered and what is not was the very threshold um, through which to enter this book. This book is so beautifully written, and yet it is so, if you don't mind my saying, it is so terrible in other ways. Just the, the recitation of the abuse that your, was visited upon your mother is very hard to read. It's obviously the, the remembering and the intuiting of the kind of physical harm that he's inflicting on your mother, but it's also terrifying and, t and horrible to read the, the, the harm he inflicted on you in trying to silence you. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's this one passage where you come home and you say, I'm going to be a writer. Right. And he says to you, you're not going to do any of that. Right. I can't think of a more terrible thing to say to a child. Yes. I, I mean, I think that anything that seemed like um, a dream that I had, uh, he was going to try to find a way to shut that down. Um, and that uh, is a very telling moment in my relationship with my mother as well, because she was, you know, obviously enduring um, physical abuse at his hands, often out of sight, but something I could hear. And for years, um, in order to, to kind of do a kind of dissembling and to keep him from uh, going into a violent rage later on out of sight, um, she, would only um, talk to me about my accomplishments or achievements when he wasn't around. It was something that we had to keep secret. But that particular day, I came home so excited, I couldn't wait. And I said that at the dinner table. And when he said, you're not gonna do any of that, I could see my mother's hand clench the fork she was holding and her jaw clench. And she said, she will do whatever she wants. And even in that moment, I knew the price that she was going to pay for defending me. And as much as it, she was, you know, willing to do that and, and knowing the cost, she wasn't going to let him batter my soul in the same way mm -hmm. that he was battering hers. Mm -hmm. Your stepfather murdered your mother. He murdered her after she had left him, after a long history of abuse. That's right. Um, that, that's the foundational fact. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. She'd been divorced for him, from him for nearly two years um, when he murdered her. So she indeed had done everything right and gotten away, and he continued to stalk her. He even went to prison for attempting well, he wasn't convicted of attempted murder, but he did try to kill her once before on Valentine's Day in 1984. He went to prison for about a year, but only convicted of criminal trespass. And when he got out, he came back and finished what he started. Natasha, it's another hard thing, but it's my understanding that he's actually been released from prison now. Is that true? That's right. He was released in March of last year. May I ask, do you feel safe from him? You know, the day that I found out, I had the strangest sensation of being inside my mother's body. And I was very afraid and I felt very unsafe. I think the only thing that makes me feel safe or a modicum of safety is that I don't live in Atlanta anymore. I got out of Atlanta just before he was released, a, a year or two before. And so that helps. The distance helps. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I've never truly felt safe in the world. Mm -hmm. Cassie Wayman writes in the New York Times that Trethewey's memoir is not the hardest book I have ever read. He says the poetry holding the prose together, the innovativeness of the composition makes such a claim impossible. Memorial Drive is the hardest book I could imagine writing. And, and truly, 
you do some very difficult things in this book. I mean, you go through the files, like you're the police officer, incredibly, you encounter the police officer who uh, responded to your mother's murder and he retrieves the files for you. Right. And you go through them all. I just find myself wondering how you were able to do that, to read, you know, the fact that she was keeping notes of what was happening to her, create, you know, to create some sort of protection from her, for herself, which ultimately did not succeed. But how, how did you, how did you do that? And why did you feel that was so necessary to do? Well, I resisted doing it for a long time. Um, you know, he gave me those files in 2005 and I did not allow myself to sit and go through them until I was in the process of writing this book. Um, I didn't want to have to, to look at those things. I'd been trying to, I think, forget and avoid as much as I could, you know, over these last, uh, you know, three decades. And finally, when I did sit down, um, it, it was as if um, I were reliving um, mm-hmm. those, those, those days. Um, they came all back to me and the grief, even now, Having done that, um, the grief feels much more immediate as opposed to sort of the the dullness of it that I've lived with, um, you know, my whole adult life. Um, But I think it was important because it allowed the possibility of my mother's voice to enter this book along with mine. And I knew that that was important because I could tell you um, how resilient and powerful and loving she was, or I could just let you see it for yourself. And I think when you read those documents that I include in the book, you see it for yourself. The evidence is incontrovertible. I'm reminded that as we are speaking now, this country among, and and along with many, many others, many people are still in lockdown mode. I mean, many people are trapped at home. I can't help but think about other people who might be trapped in similar circumstances and as part of this effort to control this health crisis, but part of it makes me worry that another crisis is afoot. And, and I wonder if you think about that too, given what you saw, given what you grew up with. I do, and it's, it's, a, it's a terrifying moment uh, to think about how many people might be in a situation of, of domestic violence. Um, One of the things that I think about all the time is that uh, in the language of organizations committed to ending domestic violence, my mother was referred to as a perfect victim. Mm -hmm. And that's because not only um, did she do everything right, uh, did she seek out the right uh, resources to get out of this marriage, but she was also... Um, an educated professional woman who was not dependent upon her abuser for uh, for shelter, for for the care of her children, for support, for financial support. And so, if you have someone like my mother, like that, who can't even get away, what can you say to women who are in that situation but are dependent? on their abusers for support. It's almost impossible to get away. And if you add to that, that the the chances of you dying go up, not when you stay, but when you leave, it makes it almost impossible. And we are in a moment where all of that is the case now, and it's even harder to leave because where will people go um, during this time of lockdown? This country is very, you know, fractured and traumatized right now, I feel comfortable in saying. Um, Is there something we can learn from your story, do you think, as a country? Oh, well, I I would hope a lot of things, actually. Um, You know, one of the things that I I deal with constantly is the idea of uh, memory and forgetting. on a personal level, you know, one might argue that for a long time, I enacted a kind of forgetting, thinking that that was 
helping me some kind of way. And yet, um, even as I was consciously trying to forget, I think our bodies recall trauma. So it was still there with me, waiting to so somehow attack me at a different point. I think that's a, a metaphor for um, our kind of cultural amnesia in this country, that wounds that we haven't healed, that we've simply allowed to fester, are waiting to make us sick, to make us even more damaged because we haven't contended with the truth of our shared history. I think that that's what this moment of reckoning is about. So I always, you know, Yates wrote, we make of the quarrel with others rhetoric, but of the quarrel with ourselves poetry. I always begin with the argument, the quarrel I have with myself in order to talk about the larger quarrel that I have with my nation over and our historical amnesia about race, about the aftermath of the Civil War, about the causes of the Civil War, about the reason that we erected monuments to the Confederacy. All of those things, if we don't deal with the truth of them, they're going to continue to erode us as a nation. Natasha Trapme, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you, Michelle. Some of those stories are hard to hear. And finally tonight, another artist who's unafraid to speak the truth, no matter how painful. Country music star Margot Price is making waves with her latest album, That's How Rumors Get Started. It weaves together issues from motherhood to healthcare, including the rock-heavy hit single, Twinkle Twinkle. Take a listen. Everything's turned inside out. powerful riff on the price of stardom. Margot Price has quite the backstory too, having experienced prison and homelessness. She funded her first album by selling her car and her wedding ring. She joined me from Nashville to talk about her fascinating life. Welcome to the program, Margot Price. It's a wonderful album. It's really listenable. Congratulations. It's your second big one. Um, what inspired you uh, on this one? And what, t tell me about the title song. Why did you choose that title? Um, yes, this is actually my third, my third album. And um, that's how rumors get started was, was something I heard in passing. And I, I just liked the, the mystery behind it. But I think, you know, we live in such an age of mistruths and, and rumors and, um, you know, it, it has a little bit of ambiguity there. <laughs> Yeah, you know, people put in air quotes, you're sort of a country music rebel, country music outlaw. You certainly talk a lot about truth. And there is a saying, of course, that country music, all you need is three chords and the truth. You speak a lot about it, from whether it's, as I said, the health or gender issues, the pay gap, et cetera. What gives you that, I guess, I guess the cojones to go all that way, given how difficult it is for women in the country music sphere. Yeah, it's, um, you know, certainly a, at times can be a very misogynist, um, you know, even racist um, genre. And, I, you know, I think for so long people have, have these misconceptions that um, anybody who plays country music is going to be, you know, right-winged or, or not liberal, but I, I come from a, a long background of, you know, blues and folk music and, um, you know, this album I think is a little more rock and roll, but certainly um, living in Nashville and being part of the anti-establishment, I've, I've never wanted to fit inside of the, the mold that was um, set there by many of the organizations in this town and it's, um, it's been challenging at times to speak out about, you know, issues like gender inequality or gun control, but I think that someone needs to be saying it, and um, I'm, I'm happy to, to lend my two cents. 
So let me ask you, because we're going to see Jeremy Ivey, who's not just your husband, but he's also your creative partner and an artistic performer, in, in obviously, in his own right. And I just want to ask you both, because I know you're going to play us out. You've chosen, I want you to explain uh, the song you've chosen. I believe it's for uh, your son, your older son, and why you've chosen this. And then play us out as we say good night and thanks for watching. Margot and Jeremy, thank you very much for your rendition of Gone to Stay. Thank you so much for having us. Um, this is a song that we wrote to to our children, and it's it's a message of you know when we're gone on the road, to know that we're always with them, but also to know that when we're gone um, and when we and when we pass, um, this is a message that we wanted to to give to them and how to treat other people and and what to leave behind, and you know to not take so much from this struggling earth right now. So this is when I'm gone. <laughs> 